truth sanctify us in your truth may the prayer you prayed for us jesus as we know all your prayers are answered we know you pray and your prayer for us is being answered that we might believe that we might be sanctified that we might experience the joy love and glory and hope and all that you and the peace that you provide in your precious name we pray and all god's children said amen, amen. i have to tell you i had a fun a fun moment just in the last week or so, because I wanted to get out a book off of my shelf called A New Harmony of the Gospels. It is a very good book. It is a uh, harmony where all four of the Gospels are laid side by side, and I opened it up, and I found on page 177 that my Friends who were also in this class, somehow or another, when my book was off and away from me, decided they would autograph it for me. So I have Old Man, Thummy, Stone, and Russ Fromm. They're autographs right there for me. So uh, it was kind of a fun moment. But this has been a tool I've pulled off my shelf for what we'll be studying today. And what I did was approach these Gospels a little differently. And I started to look for what are the unique features of each of them. So what I noticed was, as we start with Matthew, that you can look in Matthew chapter 27, and you're going to see this account that is unique to Matthew which kind of tells us everything that Judas Iscariot was doing when he took the money back and he threw it in and what they did to get the field of flood and how he went out and hung himself. Just bear in mind there's a little contradiction. No, 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 nothing like that is in Holy Scripture. But you're going to read something in the Gospel of Matthew that's different than what is recorded in the book of Acts. As we, But it's... A statement about Judas Iscariot, which is an interesting one, and we'll maybe think about it. The other unique thing in Matthew was this thing with Pilate. And I'm just curious. Have nothing to do with this man because I have suffered much in a dream because of him. All right, there's no wrong answers. What do you think she was dreaming? Somebody, somewhere, raise your hand and let's hear. What was Pilate's wife dreaming that she suffered much because of this man in a dream? Come on. It's all holy imagination. Come on. You're wasting our precious minutes. Somebody's got to have some. Marcy, never without an idea. And never uncomfortable with sharing it with us. What was her dream? It, oh, it needs to be turned on. Push that little button on the end of it. Okay, somehow, some way, your microphone is not working. Dan, is yours? Let me see it, Jackson. Uh, it is, yes. Yeah, so what was the dream? And now in this little break, if you could take that, go back and see if that microphone channel that channels muted or not dan all right marcy go ahead well you know sometimes we get dreams of warnings and um things that we receive by god or wherever we're, what we're thinking and i think maybe god was trying to um, warn her and caution her as to what's coming i mean dreams can be interpreted in different okay ways. what did she dream though any idea <laughs> She had a dream. We know that. God was working through the dream. Right. But what did she dream? She probably dreamed that she, that, that she needed to caution her husband, Pontius Pilate, about what was taking place and how he should take care of things. Gotcha. Okay. Where'd Dan go? Uh, Jerry's got an idea. So just here, Marcy, I'll take it from you. I'm thinking maybe 
that she, uh, she was gonna take over the throne of her and her husband. Uh-oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Pilate, if you do something, you're gonna bring yourself down. Uh, she was thinking along those lines, perhaps. Oh, welcome. A guest has arrived, Sally Spitzmiller. Welcome. And I assume you have Terry tagging along behind you? Oh, no. We couldn't make it. So welcome, Sally. Uh, I'm sure you know somebody here that you can go sit with. All right. So one more real, real quick. Anybody? Any, any other thoughts on a, a dream that Pilate's wife may have had? So uh, it's, it's nothing of real significance, so let's move on. How about this cry? Isn't it interesting? His blood be on us and on our children. What irony, right? Do they know what they're saying? His blood be on us. Matthew records that. And who can help us with this microphone? I don't want to have it. I'll give it to a runner. All right, Jeff, you have been nominated. You can help out if we need you till Dan returns, perhaps. So, uh, his blood be on us. And I, is what were they thinking? Certainly not what we would be saying. May your blood be on me. May your blood be on us. Unique to Matthew. Another unique feature: the earthquake at the time of. Christ dying, and the tombs opening. And these people who were apparently not at the stage of decomposition, <laughs> that they came out of their tombs. Uh, we had no skeletal uh, skeletons wandering, but people came out. This happened with different people in, Eli in the Old Testament, the, the uh, tomb where the prophet uh, Elisha's bones were, when the man went in there, came out alive. This is a, you know, we don't know what to make of it. But like Lazarus, what happened to these people? We know it happened to Lazarus. What happened to them? They died again. And they were buried again. Uh, Roman guards at the tomb. That's a significant one. Two times Matthew talks about it. The first one is where we see these soldiers being sent to put the seal on the tomb, which was a wax seal of some sort with a Roman stamp, signet ring, whatever. It is sealed by, the Ro by Rome, and anyone who violates it dies. Um, Matthew has the guards uh, being told to lie, and they lie about what happened at the tomb. He's writing to Jews, right? That makes sense. Anyone else want to pipe in, share something about this unique element of Matthew? Well, we're going to move on. We have a lot of territory to cover. Unique features, and I do want us to go to this one in the Gospel of Matthew or Mark, rather, in chapter 16. <coughs> unique features are there. It's not unique that Jesus appears to Mary or that he appeared to the two Emmaus disciples. But in the context of the Great Commission, what is different is whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands. If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will not 
They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So what do we make of this? And I know all of our manuscripts, all of our Bibles handle it a little bit differently. My Bible has some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16 verses 9 through 20. Anybody else's Bible have a note there? Any study Bibles as to what you find there? Anybody with a study Bible in their hands that gives some notes about chapter 16, 9 through 20? We see it in the scriptures. Is it inspired in there and is it part of the infallible word of God? Now the, the things against it are it's not in the oldest manuscripts, which are the earliest ones also. And they are they're asterisked in some of the Greek manuscripts. Jeannie, what does your study Bible say or what would you add? Um mine there's a note on 618 that says no occurrence of drinking deadly poison without harm is found in the new testament okay only that one thing out of the list drinking and not being harmed but we know paul was struck by a a uh, snake laura's got a note that she can share uh, a little bit of an insight further into this Mark 16, 9 to 20. I mean, there's a lot here. I'd have to take a minute to digest it, but it does say it should be read with caution. Um, that many think it's, to, it's a later edition and not original. Okay. Anyone else? But, well, for it is the fact that the early church fathers acknowledged it, recognized it, and while some of the earlier manuscripts do not have it, the vast majority of them do. There are more manuscripts with verses 9 through 20 than without it. It's an age-old process of knowing the text is one that is a part of the manuscripts and truths of God. Uh, what's more reliable? The ones closer to the time when they were written. Jeannie, what else do you have? I did find more. Um, in this study Bible, it says that serious doubt exists as to whether these verses belong to the original Gospel of Mark. They are absent from important early manuscripts and display certain peculiarities of vocabulary, style, and theological content that are unlike the rest of Mark. His gospel probably ended it at 16 verse 8, or its original ending has been lost. Okay. It would be odd. Uh, read verse 8 and... Someone with your Bible in hand, read verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's a strange way to end. <laughs> yes, it sure is a strange way to end. So that's why a lot of people say that's a strange way to end. It makes sense that there is a, another ending. Jackson? I found it interesting in that Bible that it says that it's possible that the true ending was lost to time. Is there any theological like understanding that the word of God could be lost to time? That's a comment I'm not sure we are comfortable with. Uh, I believe God and his word is going to, if someone... <laughs> who is a human writes a book and others take it and do something with it, there are steps that we might take to protect what we've written. If this is God's word, I would have a hard time with the idea myself that somehow or another, some part of God's word was lost. Mm -hmm. I do know God worked through the church. Is there an is there a final word? Is there a final answer to this question that's been out there for a long time? 
let's just point out, as the one person did in Jeannie's Bible, her commentator added the note, no one drank deadly poisons and did not die. And I'm scratching my head, I'm trying to think, does the fact that that didn't happen as recorded in any biblical or extra biblical times say that kind of truth is not going to be accepted as that might rule out this whole section because nobody ever drank something and did not die. I don't know. That doesn't say this isn't to be accepted. It's just an interesting thing that Mark's gospel would end with verse 8. It seems like there should be more. And the appearance to Mary is in other gospels. The appearance to the Emmaus disciples in Luke's gospel. The Great Commission in some form or fashion in the other gospels. We, of course, it's very interesting. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Is that a scriptural promise that we hold to? He that believeth not stands condemned already. It's a scriptural passage that has a lot of power attached to it. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believes, it's like, for God so loved the world, he did not send his son to condemn the world. Baptism is a regenerative, salvific work of God, but it is not essential for salvation. So the second half makes it very clear the most important thing is what we focused in on today. Do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? It's not the lack of baptism that would damn anyone, but the despising of it. Those are the wise words of St. Augustine. It's not the lack that would damn. It's the despising of it. If you know the teachings of God's word about baptism and you reject it, that might be an indicator. All right, lots in Luke's gospel in terms of this one other trial. Annas. Caiaphas, and going to Herod. That's not in the other Gospels. And that's where Herod is wanting to see something, remember? You read it. And Jesus, in his dealings with Herod, it results in him sending Jesus back. And what happens with Pilate and Herod, according to Luke's Gospel, they become friends from that day. Another unique feature is when Jesus is taken and he's on the Via Della Rosa and he's carrying the cross beam, 80 some pounds, the whole cross would weigh almost 300 pounds, but just the cross beam. He's in a very weakened condition after having been scourged and flogged, sleep deprivation, dehydrated, everything he went through. So Simon of Cyrene gets brought in. But don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Right? Only the Gospel of Luke records, to truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the lengthy Emmaus disciple walk and talk. Do you find that interesting and somewhat entertaining? So let's talk about that one for a little bit. Why didn't they recognize Jesus? What are some of the possibilities? Ron raised his hand. Marcy raised hers. So Jeff's got you covered. Jackson, why, Ron? I, I think that 
they were so preconceived, you know, that he was dead and gone that th they wouldn't have recognized him. All right, that's one theory. And you, Marcy? Well, when I did the Emmaus walk, it's like when you go into a retreat and when they were walking on that road, they had their eyes blinded as to Jesus being with them. And at the end of the road, they could see him because God allowed them to All see right, him. All right, so you're, you're thinking God veiled the eyes or something else was used by God to veil. Okay, that's another idea. Very good, Marcy. Thank you. Anybody else? Jenny? <laughs> when Luke was written for... Luke was written for the Greeks from the Greeks' perspective. You have to remember that when you read Luke. Right. So that, you know, this veiling of, not being able to see, a little different idea on Luke's gospel than others. Reverend Ken, what do you think? Where, where'd you go, Reverend Ken? Oh, <laughs> you're disappearing on me. Yeah, I, I, I saw you sitting right over there. Now you're not there anymore. All right, go take the mic to Reverend Ken. Let's hear his theory. Why don't they recognize Jesus? I mean, it is possible. The last time they saw Jesus, he would have been in the process of whipping and crucifying, et cetera, et cetera. Not in good shape. So I'm just saying, humanly speaking, the last time they saw him, he didn't look normal. And now, who knows what, I mean, he's still Jesus had the same face, but, you know, people's faces change, especially as they go through sickness, illness, death, et cetera. So it could be simple human changes. His, in his, his body was marred beyond human recognition, is, but he now has a new spiritual body. And there's something else that's happened. What happened to the very recognizable clothing that Jesus wore throughout his earthly life and ministry. All right, don't, don't just shout it out. Let's talk, Jeannie. What happened to his clothing? It got divided up and, get, you know, taken away by the soldiers. And this one tunic that he wore, these tunics were actually ones that were somewhat identifiable tunics. They were personalized, not that he had anything on it, like a, a logo, <laughs> Jesus Christ. But uh, uh, they wouldn't, you know, he's dressed differently. He looks different. He's in a spiritual body. Their eyes are veiled. Perhaps they're looking into the sun, and they cannot see. There's all kinds of possibilities, but isn't it fun to think, you know, uh, you don't know about these things? You know, all this stuff's been going on, and you, you don't know anything about this? You have to chuckle, right? Who knows best about the things that have been happening than Jesus, right? Uh, it's an amazing thing. How can Jesus, while he's hanging on the cross, and we know he's not been placed into the tomb, how can he make a statement to the criminal, today, you will be with me in paradise? How's that possible? There are good answers to this. How is that possible? Come on, saints, you know the scriptures. How is it possible that this promise can be spoken? Ron's ready. If Jeff, you can get a microphone over here to Ron. Thank you, Jeff, for helping. Well, I think the, the words that, that the thief said shows that he had faith. Okay, well, I'm talking about Jesus, though. I mean, today? Today's today. If I say today, I'll meet you over at McDonald's for a cup of coffee, Ron. Today, we'll make it happen. What does today mean? Today. Today, today I, I, I believe we. you can just move out of one life right into another. Yeah, that's the good, good insight we're getting to, Sally. His time is not our time. His time is not our time. What happens at the moment of death? Space, David, what, what's happening here? What do you think? 
And when you die, your soul goes to heaven. His body hasn't been risen yet, but his soul goes to heaven. When okay, he so to be out of the body is to be with the Lord. Yeah. That's so being with Jesus after you, you know, the, the saints who die and our death and the time that elapses in between, this is not soul sleep. Some say it's soul sleep. No, there's no time. To be out of the body is to be with the Lord. It's one theory that, you know, yeah, today I'll be with you and you'll be with me in eternity. It's a, so John's gospel, I like these unique features. What happened in John 18, 18? Peter was standing, warming himself by a charcoal fire. What happened, as we look into this some more, keep that in mind. But again, the trial before Annas is only in John's Gospel. Pontius Pilate with Jesus and the religious leaders, that whole thing, uh, there's a whole lot more in John, right, about the time with Pontius Pilate. And of the seven words, behold your son, behold your mother, and I thirst, another is, it is finished, to tell us thy. The bones of Jesus will not be broken, John 19. Nicodemus with Joseph of Arimathea to get the body of Jesus from the cross. And this whole upper room thing that we just read today and reflected on is only in John's gospel, as is the Sea of Galilee. Steve, what would you add? These are fun things to think about. Yeah, um, the, uh, I'm thinking about Jesus' crucifixion and Pilate as well, um, the, the relationship there. And, and Pilate, to me, seems like a guy on the bubble. He's a guy on the edge of the blade. He, d he doesn't know which side he's going to fall. Um, and, and the one thing that also we need to remember is that Jesus was taken down from the cross. Typically, the standard was that if you were crucified on a cross, you stayed there until you rotted. Mm -hmm. um, the very fact that they, uh, they allowed the, um, that Pilate, and Pilate was the one who um, said that Jesus, apparently, I don't, it's not in scripture, but said that they could take him down from the cross and put him in, and give him to uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, um, I, Arimathea? Yeah, Arimathea. So that's a significant decision if you think about it on Pilate's part because he probably, he didn't agree with, with any of what was going on there. He even said he's not guilty. Washing his hands. Pilate is known to be uh, a person who is somewhat ruthless and, and cold. And the Coptic church actually believes Pontius Pilate and his wife became Christians, and they acknowledge them as saints in the Coptic church. Um, there's nothing in Scripture that tells us that, right? But, uh, yeah, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover and the Jewish leaders, this whole thing of, getting Jesus' body off of the cross and into the tomb and with the anointing and the wrapping. Uh, normally, yes, they would leave a body there and the birds and the bugs and the sun and the decomposition would all happen while someone remained on a cross being crucified. Persians developed crucifixions. The Romans, <laughs> they... They really made it what we know it to be. They, they were the ones who really improved it and perfected it, <laughs> the whole idea of crucifixion. Um, sea of Galilee. You remember reading in the Bible recap about the number of fish. What does she say? And that's an interesting thing. When they caught the fish earlier, all night long they didn't catch anything and then Jesus from the shoreline says cast your net on the other side of the boat and they caught so much they couldn't bring it in with two boats now this account 
they caught 153 fish. What, what does Tara, Tara Lee say about that number? And it's been, Origen has a very early church father, Origen says all kinds of stuff about 153. Who's going to answer that question? You're doing your homework, aren't you? You're staying up with your Bible recap. Laura's going to, what's 153? So historians say that there were 153 varieties of fish in Galilee and the sea at that time. And so 153 represented that they caught one of each type, which would then be a reference to them being fishers of men and how they would be um, fishing for men from each nation. There would be multiple people represented in their gathering. Yeah, and, they, and, and she took us back to the parable that Jesus told about, you know, the, the, the netting up of the fish and the keeping of the good fish and the casting away of the bad fish. And, you know, so 153 good ones, the species within the Sea of Galilee. So therefore, all nations, all people are being brought, right? So it's this question, how do we believe? Is it seeing is believing or believing is seeing as the work of God? What do we have? You believe because you have seen? Question mark. That's the unique feature of the ESV. They put it in a question mark form. You're believing because you see? Blessed are the eyes that have not seen and yet have believed. I know we've we uh, have other translations that don't put it in the form of a question. But how is it that Thomas believes? And I appreciated your comments today with the children, Carrie. Doubting is not a sin. Doubt is that dreaded envelope that no one wants to open up. Helmut Tillich, a German, German pastor and theologian. But once you open it up and once you... Take your doubts on in a God-pleasing manner. You come out stronger in that area of your doubt. Key is you've got to question. You've got to bring your questions. You've got to bring your to other people. And prayerfully, I love the fact Jesus is saying, stop your misbelieving and believe. He doesn't chastise. He doesn't. And in all of our lives, we need to know doubt is not a sin. You want to do what you need to with your doubts, though. Ask the questions. Go to others. Go to the Word of God. Ask God to help you through it. And you'll grow through that. Anybody want to share? This is getting real personal, though. I don't know. What's a doubt? that you have had as a person that you have actually come out stronger in the end. David? Well, Thomas said he wouldn't believe until he actually touched the wounds on Jesus' body. And then after he touched them, he, you know, he said he believed. We believe because the Word of God is powerful. It's a two-edged sword. Who can believe it hasn't heard? But when you hear, you believe. Yeah. So, you know, I haven't. I haven't seen Jesus, but I believed in him. Yeah. Anybody want to talk about a, something you had some questions about and you were really wrestling with and wondering, and now it's something you have a firm conviction about? You've come out on the other end. Jenny, share with us, please. Thank you for being willing to. I have a doubt with the healing uh, of Christ because... I watched my mother die of cancer, and I was with her the whole time. And somebody told me, well, if you would have just had more faith, mm -hmm. she might have recovered. And that has hit me since her death about this healing concept. And I didn't have enough faith. My mother didn't have enough faith that she wasn't healed. And I wrestle with that to this day about this healing concept. And who's healed, who's not healed, and, and ye of little faith. And All right. We are going to minister the truths of God's word 
little by little by little through this gathering, what would we tell Jenny or anyone who is thinking along these lines? What would we say? And collectively, we're going to minister to you, Jenny. In the Bible, it says that all of this is for God's glory. So all the healing that did happen was happened to show God's glory. But not everybody gets healed, and it's God's choosing, and it has nothing to do with how much faith or how little faith you have. Okay. okay. So if you pray and ask for healing, God's still there, but it may not. he may be ready to call that person home. But throughout the trial, you, God wants you to use that to show his glory and Thank your you. faith. Someone else. That's a good thing. Jeannie, how, I, I love the way the church can minister. Way back, oh gosh, this was decades ago. Um, I can't even remember if my daughter was born. So it was back in the 90s, early 90s. Uh, we had a friend back from Egan, um, Minnesota, who had cancer. And he knew that we had a healing ministry down here. They came down with my parents. They were strong believers filled with the Holy Spirit. And they came down here and they had a series of prayers while they were here. And um, it looked good for him. I don't remember what type of cancer. Um, he ended up, he got there was a period where he improved, and then he ended up, I don't remember the time frame, he ended up passing away. He ended up going to heaven. But his wife told us that there was a healing inside him that he didn't know that he needed. Hmm. There was something going on that God used that, and not only that, that Whatever happened in him with the strength, I mean, don't get me wrong, he was a strong Christian anyway. So whatever happened in him, when they went back up to Minnesota, God used that then to minister not just to their kids, but then to others in our, my former congregation and stuff like that. Mm. It was powerful. God yeah, used yeah. it, as Kiri said, to his glory, and yeah. then he took him home. And for all things to work together all, for good. That's right, to, look, to work God's for glory. good. Thank you, Jeannie and Kerry. It was, it was we have sad a couple on more hands. Part. Kim, what would you add to what Kerry and Jeannie have said as we talk to our sister Jenny? I would say, too, unfortunately, um, that is a common thing about he, you had more faith kind of a thing, but it's a, it's a bad theology, whereas you're putting your faith in your own faith, it becomes a works-based theology, and your faith is in God, not in your own strength, and you got to do this to make it happen. That's a works-based theology. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> Isn't the body of Christ beautiful? Keep going, Jerry. Okay, yeah, uh, Jenny, what I want to say is that uh, God has a master plan, and his plan is good and right. And then Pastor Mark beat me to it, but I was going to say, then Romans 8, 28 says, all things, you know, work together for good. And also, you got to keep in mind, was she a Christian? Yeah, so to those that love God at the end of Romans 8, 28. And eternal, perfect healing. And we want, you know, to, in this life, see our loved ones stay with us and be with us and we need to release them and entrust them into the hands of the Lord and something so much better, right? Uh, but that's not the word we want to say to somebody in the midst of what they're going through. Oh, they're, they're in a better place. Uh, enter into the place where those people are. Don't, don't offer casual comments and cliches. Just weep with those that weep. You don't have, you know, I had 
one of the worst things in my life as a pastor was getting a call at 4 o'clock in the morning that one of our young men from our church was brutally murdered in a bar, and he was shot nine times. A man walked in with an automatic weapon and killed him, and his mother was just devastated. Do I go in and say, oh, Jimmy's in a better place? No, I cried all morning long with her. I just wept. And, you know, it was the most interesting thing. He died just a few days before Reformation Day. His funeral was on October 31st. And his confirmation verse, life verse, was... Psalm 46, verse 1. And when he had created a cross, on his cross, he put nine jewels. And it was a case of mistaken identity. The man thought he was someone else and brutally killed him. Then God moved. A scholarship was created for Jimmy Mack. But the most miraculous thing that happened was she went into prison ministry. And she went into prison ministry and she went into a hardcore prison with murderers. And she gave her testimony. And she said, you know, no matter what you have done wrong, God loves you. God will forgive you. And she tells, I pray for that family. And, you know, so at the end of the day, after the, there was a six foot five or six giant African-American man. While Susie was there, he walked right down where she was. And she's thinking, oh, no. And he walked right in front of her. And he stopped. And he raised his hands. And he held them over her. And he started singing. A worship song. And it was the song that Jimmy and his mother always sang with each other. She had not said anything about it. And he just started singing a blessing over her, and she received such a blessing. You see, God turns evil for good. And so, Jenny, a lot of good stuff coming to you. Just know God loves you, and he's with you in the midst of it all. And we, 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 we do need to go on. But why was the, what was this charcoal about the on the shoreline? They came in, the fish was all being cooked, and only two times in... Gospels are the words of a charcoal fire used. So Peter came after warming himself by the one charcoal fire. He comes and Jesus has a fish breakfast for them. Charcoal fire. Uh, So we already talked about the exact number of fish. All right. Oh, all these seven, uh, you know, they're not the last words of Jesus, but they're the words of Jesus from the cross. <laughs> they're the last words. He always has the last word. And, you know, there's, there, I want you to look at them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You might want to think about those and share a little bit in a, just a moment with your small group talk. There are all kinds of, I did, this is not a full listing of all the foolish theories rejecting the resurrection. Right? The swoon theory. Jesus just swooned on the cross. He really just swooned and the disciples took him off the cross and he was resuscitated. Uh, someone robbed the grave. The wrong tomb theory. (laughs) You know, these things are all out there. The wishful thinking theory. Uh, The animals hate the body. (laughs) When I read that one, I think about homework. It's a (laughs) 
<laughs> when, the, when the, the student goes to tell the teacher that the dog ate my homework. Okay. <laughs> Mass hallucination theory. You know, everybody's hallucinating all the people, not just one or two or 12 or 70 or 120, but 500 people are mass hallucinating about seeing Jesus. All right? All these theories. Uh, it's interesting. We do have extra biblical sources, a letter written in 73 AD. Now, you look at this and you say, well, 73 AD, a letter we have, 90 AD uh, comments from Josephus, 110 or 120 AD Tacitus, Babylonian Talmud, 200 AD. And you're thinking, wow, that, that's, that's a long time after the fact. <laughs> but we believe in all kinds of people of history who have nothing said about them. And nothing nearly as soon as these, these are the ones we have a hand, we have actual bib, extra biblical sources. These are not proponents for, not followers of, they're just historians who are giving their witness to Jesus. So I do want to take a moment with the book of Acts because I thought this was so cool. What are the other possibilities for the titles? Like I said in the Sunday sermon, acts of the Lord Jesus Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit in his church. Acts of the apostles, they're not doing them, but that's what we have, acts or acts of the apostles. How did they baptize 3,000 on one day? Who did all the baptisms? There's pools. Salome, Bethesda, and there are mikveh and mikvahs, singular, plural, mikvahs, plural. Who can perform holy baptisms and what are the benefits? There's all kinds. I want you to maybe talk about this at your tables. But these mikvehs are these ritualistic bath things, and Tara Lee Cobble talks about them. They are finding hundreds of them under the rubble of Jerusalem. Within proximity to the temple are hundreds of these ritualistic baths, and they're scattered all over the Holy Land, and their archaeologists are finding them, and on the pilgrimage they would come. So, a lot of ideas. Who performed the baptisms for 3,000 people? Did the 12? Did more than the 12? We would not know for sure. But there's 120, and these things are all over the place. Who can perform a baptism? Come on, theologians. Who can perform a baptism? Raise your hand if you want to answer the question from Luther's small catechism. Who can perform a baptism? It's anyone, anybody, emergency baptisms, right? Why do we have pastors perform baptisms? For the sake of order and decency and order, not because they're the only ones who can perform a baptism. Yeah, so the baptism is, but what are the benefits and blessings? Come on, real quickly, before we release you for 10 minutes of talk or more, what are the benefits and blessings of baptism from God's word? And this is God's work because it's not man's work. What are the things these people are getting as they're being baptized? Acts 2, 37 to 39. Come on, Tony, don't be so stubborn. Raise your hand because you know the answer and you can answer it well. Somebody else besides Tony. What are the benefits and blessings of baptism, Tony? Forgiveness of sin. Okay, one. What's another one, somebody? Or not, Tony. Go ahead, Jeannie. Receive. Receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay, forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. What would we say is another benefit? Being a child of God. Identified, adopted as a child of God. What's another one? Because that kind of ties in with another beautiful one because you're not a, an only child. <laughs> okay, body. What's another one? You're not an only child. You're adopted into 
eternal life. You receive the gift of life, spiritual life that transforms into eternal life. And you are, we're not done. A member of the family of God. You are brought into the baptized into the body. One of the other really good ones, a couple good ones, we have not, not left out. Uh, have we said yet regeneration, rebirth, the spirit, and you are delivered from the devil. And you're all those wonderful benefits. In Acts 6, we see how the early church functioned to meet a need. They thought it through. They talked it through. They prayed it through. They met, planned it through, and they did it. So you can talk in your small groups a little bit more about that. Meta narrative, well, <coughs> reversal of the tower. I like the fact that 3,000 people died at the Golden Calf incident and 3,000 people were baptized. So God's restorative work. 30 pieces of silver, my God, my God, all kinds of reverse red threads. Bones of Jesus, Judas, Pentecost. Now the interesting, Acts says that Judas fell down and his blood and his guts all fell out. How do you say that after he hung himself. They didn't take Judas Iscariot's body off of the, the tree he was hung on. What happened to his body? Jackson? It fell. It fell. And what would happen with a body that hung on a cross and, or hung on a tree by hanging and the sun and the bugs and the birds and everything else What's going to happen to that body when it hits the ground? His guts are all going to spill out. So people want to question. So a lot of good God shots. God in Christ exhibits humility. The holy, you know, this is a great truth. When you, a person, submit to another person, as a leader or as a spouse, mutual submission, it's voluntarily done. Jesus submitted to the Father. This does not mean the Father is greater than the Son. There's a humility and a submission within the Trinity, miraculous things. God does seem almost mundane. He doesn't forsake sinful people. Good stuff. And you're going to talk about that in your group. Who was at the foot of the cross? I love this list that I found. Men and women, Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, high class, no class, religious, irreligious. And you, as well as me, you can read that more on your own. Lord, bless our time together and get us uh, ready for either heading home or heading into the, the next worship service. And we ask that you keep uh, working in us as we move into a new season with the Bible Recap. And we start to consider a reimagining the church and how the church is going to be our focus. The life of Christ now is manifested in the life of the church. Bless our next month as we are studying, uh, next month and a half as we spend time wrapping up the Bible recap in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed day.